Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Bible Chapel. Welcome again to anybody online joining us. We're glad you're here with us as well. If it's your first time visiting us and you happen to be here in person, I'd appreciate it if you find a guest card in a pew around you there. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering boxes in the back of the room on your way out. And please grab one of our visitor gifts out in the lobby, a church mug out there with some treats and goodies in it. Well, before we jump into our passage this morning, I want to ask you to think about what is your purpose in life? What's your reason for being? Why do you exist? What is the significance of you and what you're doing? Not always an easy question to ask. Well, my mission in life is to uh, do good at school to get good grades so I can get into a good college or a good trade school so I can get a good job to pay off my loans so I can make enough money to retire early so I have more free time to do what I want and then I'll die. Sounds good, maybe, (laughs) part of that sounds good, but most of us will recoil from that description and say, well, no, that's not really my purpose. Other people will say, well, perhaps my my purpose is family, okay? I'm going to serve my family. I'm going to perhaps have children. My purpose is to raise the next generation. That's very noble. Um, maybe you'd say, well, no, my purpose is to help others. I want to try to make life better for some other people, and if I can do that, this can be my life's purpose. And that's also very noble. But how lasting are either of those? A 100,000 years in the future, when we're dead and gone and no one has any idea who we are, what will that matter If we're not careful, we could go through life purposeless or without any kind of meaning, or perhaps the wrong kind of purpose. It's one of my favorite posters for about the last 20 years. Look on the screen. Look at this. Title, Mistakes. Subtitle, It Could Be That the Purpose of Your Life is Only to Serve as a Warning to Others. Okay, there's not the kind of purpose you want for your life, right? Right? What about this advice I found on the internet? This is, this is more helpful. Look at this one. This advice says this. Don't look for a purpose in your life. Create it yourself. And that may be very good advice. And you know what? That is actually absolutely good advice if we take a view of the world that our existence is essentially without any absolute meaning. I mean, there is an approach to life which says, look, life and existence is essentially meaningless. There is no significance to this. But what we can do is do the best we can to create meaning for ourselves. And you know what? That could be good advice. And and that is absolutely good advice if that is how the universe is. That is absolutely good advice if if there is no reference point outside the universe to latch on to our purpose. And so this is one of the great advantages of religion. This is one of the great advantages of Christianity. If it is true that there is a God, then by definition, your life is measured according to his purpose and desire for you. And this is one of the great blessings of Christianity. If you are a follower of Jesus, if all this stuff is true and you have uh, pledged yourself to Jesus, you've come into his kingdom, you have been accepted by him into his family, your life is now all about God. And you actually do have an incredible set of purposes and significances. Every decision in our lives then are actually full of significance. And this is actually very helpful to life. This is very good for us. So what is our purpose? What is our mission for being here as Christians, perhaps, as believers in Jesus? Well, there's probably a variety of purposes and missions that we have. Uh, Right now in our church, the elders, we're kind of prayerfully wrestling with the idea of, okay, what is our church mission? What is our purpose? What are those specific things that God is calling us to as a church? And one step in this process is kind of thinking through what are called core values, it's like, okay, what are, what's in the DNA of this church? What are some things that, that we value as an organization? What are some things that we want to value? And so I got this idea of core values on my mind. 
when we hit this passage we're going to look at today, the first section of the book of Revelation, I think what we see from John is three core values for all Christians to recognize. In the opening book, in the, or sorry, in the opening part of this book, we're going to see what I think are clearly three core values for us as Christians. And it will help us as we think through the purpose of our life, the significance of our life, what we are here for if we consider these three core values for us as Christians this morning. So that's how we'll frame our discussion. I hope you grabbed a bulletin when you came in. Pull it out. We'll see our passage laid out for us there. If you're online, you can download that somewhere there in a link under the video description. If you don't have a bulletin, feel free to get one in back. Today we'll look at Revelation 1, 1 to 8. As John launches into this book, And again, we will be looking at these three core values for all of us as Christians. So let's start with the first one. First core value I see in this passage is this. Respond to Christ's message with obedience. Look with me here at the beginning of this passage. We read this last week. We'll read it again. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's quite the chain of transmission here. John says this message comes from God to Jesus, to his angel, to John, to us. Look at verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it. If you look at the older version of this translation, the older version of the NIV, it just said, blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy. Notice the newer version has critiqued that a little bit. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. That's because they're setting the scene for us what this looks like in the first century. When most people can't read, uh, the Christians and the churches these are sent to, they don't have their own individual copy of this scroll. So the way it's done is you've got one person up front reading aloud the book of Revelation as everyone else is hearing. And so notice what is said here. There's a blessing for the one reading this, like we are here, and there's a blessing for the one hearing it. Now, blessing is kind of a churchy word we throw around. What does that mean? To have God's blessing, I think, is to have his favor, to have some benefit from him, some good thing that only he can give. Do we want God's blessing? Go like this, yes. Well, it's pretty good, right? It's simple. Right? We read the letter, and we hear the letter, and we get blessed. Is that how it works? Yeah, but there's a catch. Look at the catch. Verse, uh, what verse is this? Three? Yes, look at verse three. Blessed are those who hear it and what? Take to heart what is written in it. So there's the catch. Okay, there's no automatic payoff just to hear this. What matters is that we take it to heart. We internalize it. We put it into practice. We obey it. Okay, so this reminds me of what we see Jesus saying back in Luke 11. Look on the screen. Read this out loud with me off the screen if you would. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. So this positions the book of Revelation right here at the beginning, not not a a roadmap of the future to satisfy our curiosity, to figure out what's going to happen in the end times primarily, but this is primarily something that is to be taken to heart, primarily something that is to be acted on, as John calls the churches he's writing to, to faithfulness under pressure, faithfulness under persecution. Look at why. It was a difficult saying for us. Verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it. Take to heart what is written in it, because why? Because the time is near. Hmm. Notice how that is emphasized up in verse 1, the same theme of nearness. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. So what's the obvious problem? It's been a while. It's been 2,000 years, John. This must be some strange usage of the word soon we were not previously aware of. 
what in the world do we do with that? I mean, that makes it look like this is just one among many of other failed apocalyptic visions promising God's soon intervention. Well, Christians handle this in different ways. Like we said over the last couple of weeks, some people will interpret Revelation as symbolically focusing mostly around what happened in the year 70 in the first century when the temple got destroyed. And they'll say Revelation is largely fulfilled already in the first century when Jesus comes in judgment on Israel, except for the final coming. And that could be. Other people will say, no, no, that's not very plausible. But rather, you guys, you're, you're missing the, the great symbolic nature of the visions of the book of Revelation. And what's really promised and pictured in most of Revelation is Jesus' repeated coming in judgment to the church and to the world as we have these cycles of Jesus coming in judgment through the book of Revelation, meaning that Jesus is often coming in judgment to his people and coming to save his people. And he's always active like this, and there will be a final fulfillment in the beginning. That makes good sense as well. But what if we want to hold on to a futuristic understanding of Revelation that says, no, it really does seem to be dialed in on the actual world events right before Jesus' return. Could we hold on to that understanding and still make sense of this language of soon? Well, I think we can, as mysterious as it is, and I think here's how we would do this. What we need to recognize, I think for John, what is most important is not how long it's going to be until this happens. But what is most important for John has to do with the kind of time he finds himself in. What's most important is the kind of time we find ourselves in. In other words, the era we find ourselves in right now. Here's what I mean. So this opening part of Revelation seems deliberately dependent by John on Daniel chapter 2. We have exact repetition of some key words from this section of Daniel chapter 2, which is uh, Daniel's interpretation of an apocalyptic vision. So look here at Daniel 2. And, and you can, if you look on your outline, circ, you could circle the word revelation in verse 1, circle the word show, and circle the word must soon take place, those phrases. So these are key distinctive phrases clustered right in this section of Daniel 2 that John seems to be drawing on specifically. Look at Daniel 2, starting verse 27. Daniel replied. He's trying to interpret the dream of the, the king. No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he's asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown, okay, there's that key word, King Nebuchadnezzar, what will happen in days to come? Now, if you look at the Greek translation of this, if you look at the Greek Old Testament version of Daniel 2, and remember John's writing in Greek, the first Christians are reading the Greek Old Testament, we'll see these exact words, including this exact phrase. But in Greek, what this says is, what, will, what must take place in the last days? Daniel 2, it says, I'm going to tell you what must take place in the last days. And I haven't given you all this, or other words get used here in Daniel 2. What, Dan, what, sorry, what John does, he takes this phrase, what must take place, but notice, instead of saying what must take place in the last days, he switches it and interprets it and says what? I will show you what must take place soon. And the reason he does this is the Christians are aware that with the resurrection of Jesus, the end times have begun. Okay, the last days are here. We often talk about, oh, what's going to happen in the end times in the last days. But the New Testament theological understanding, that era begins with the resurrection of Jesus. Because the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of the final resurrection. So the fullness of the ages is here. Uh, if anyone's in Christ, the new creation is here, uh, Paul says. So look at Mark 1.15, where we see the exact same words that John uses here in Greek about this is going to happen soon. All right? Look what Jesus says when he's preaching the kingdom. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. There's that word. Now, Jesus does not mean the kingdom has come near, but it's not here yet. What he really means is it's here. It's not here in fullness yet, but nonetheless, it is here. Notice he says the time is fulfilled. The kingdom is near. The kingdom is at hand. 
And he goes on to demonstrate the presence of the kingdom in his proclamations, like the parable of the mustard seed and his powerful miracles. So, I think how, this is how we understand John's language of near. John is aware that he is now in the end game, all right? The end has started. And with Jesus' resurrection, the world teeters on the edge of falling into God's judgment and deliverance. So it matters far less how long is it going to be before Jesus comes back. What matters is because of the kind of time John and us are living in, we're right on the verge of this. So it is near to John, it is soon to John, it is near to us, it is soon to us because of the type of existence we find ourselves in, living in the time after Jesus' resurrection. But not exactly straightforward. It's kind of weird. It's kind of mysterious. But I think that's how we could make sense of this language of imminence, of nearness, meaning this could happen at any time because we're teetering right here on the verge because we're already in the last days. So I think it's the best way that we can understand this language of nearness and, and hold on to this being true prophecy that's not just wrong, okay? So our first core value, though, not directly tied with that. First core value in this passage for the book of Revelation is clearly we are to respond to Christ's message with obedience. Jesus is going to record these visions, these teachings of John, and John expects us to hear and do it. So this is going to be one of our core values. As we seek to live out the purpose God has for us, part of this is going to be hearing what God would have us do, what Jesus would have us do, and then actually doing it. Great riddle for you. Two frogs sat on a log. One decided to jump off. How many frogs are left on the log? Two. He only decided to jump off. He didn't jump off, see? That sort of thing. I apologize. Okay, look at our second core value in this passage. Respond to Christ's grace with praise. Or maybe worship if you like that word better. Here he jumps into the letter proper, verse 4. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So here we see him starting out with kind of the classic Christian greeting, grace and peace. Grace meaning God's gift, particularly in Jesus. What is God's goodness and graciousness in Jesus who became flesh, lived a perfect life, took it, our place on the cross, paid for our sins, defeated death, raised? And if we respond to that, if we accept that grace, we're plugged into Jesus. His death becomes our death. His resurrection will be ours. We have a relationship with God, and therefore we have peace with God. Our sins have been removed. Grace and peace, John writes. Now look who this comes from. From him who is and who was and who is to come. Who's that? Now, in Sunday school, the right answer is usually Jesus or God, usually Jesus. Now, he'll turn to Jesus soon. I think in this reverence, reference, we, in this phrase, we see a reference to God himself, God the Father, perhaps, we would say. This is a powerful way to picture God as kind of forever and timeless. Look, he's the one who was, who is, and is to come. Did you guys realize that time is actually part of the physical universe? Do you realize this? It's connected with the physical universe. Did you know the faster you go, the slower time passes for you? Any remember the name for this? Time dilation. The faster you go, the slower time goes. And this has been measured by putting ultra-precise clocks in airplanes, ultra-precise clock on the ground, and the clock in the airplane, because it's going faster, will tick slower than the clock on the ground. I read that GPS satellites have to make tiny software adjustments to their clocks, because otherwise the clocks operate at different speeds because the satellites are going faster. What does this mean? This means time is a part of the physical created universe. That means God in his essence, who he is, is outside of time because time did not exist until he created the universe. 
God is the great uncaused first cause that created everything. Now, when someone who believes in God says to someone who maybe doesn't believe in God, well, we have to have a God because that's where the universe came from. It had to have a creator. What is nine times out of ten going to be the immediate response? Well, where did God, well, who caused God then? And like, oh, I guess you're right, we're thwarted. <laughs> well, it's actually a great question. What caused God? Where did God come from? What would we say? We would have to say he was eternal. There was never a time when he was not. He is the uncaused first cause. Someone might say, well, that's irrational. No, not really. What's your alternative if there's no God? The alternative is the universe itself must be eternal and uncaused. See, what we can't have is what's called an eternal regression of causes. This caused this, this caused this, this caused this. Uh, God caused the universe, this caused God. That cannot go into infinity because it could never get started. So somewhere back there, there has to be an uncaused first cause. And frankly, that's either the universe itself or God. Those are literally two choices. Well, there's a third choice, which is pantheism, which God is infused within the universe, and they're one and the same. Those are the three big answers to the big question, why is there something instead of nothing? There's only three answers. Theism, there's a God who created all things. Um, naturalism or atheism, there is no God. And the universe is eternal somehow, or multiverse is eternal. And pantheism, the universe and God are both somehow intertwined. So here's the phrase to bear in mind. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause. Is that rational and true? Yeah, it is. Otherwise, we believe in magic. Things are just popping into existence all the time. Everything that begins to exist must have a cause. And we either say the universe, in some sense, has always been here, or God, in some sense, has always been here. And the follow-up question to wrestle with then is, okay, which version is more likely to bring forth personal beings like us, an impersonal universe or a personal God who was prior to it? That's interesting. And, of course, you know what we think. Well, look, again, look at this description of God here. He is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. And actually, in Greek, John, John makes a deliberate, on-purpose, grammatical mistake here to show us exactly where he's drawing this from. He deliberately makes this mistake to connect it with this key verse in the Old Testament. Here it is, Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So here's a classic passage in the Old Testament where God reveals his sacred personal name to Israel. I am. Seems to be implying something about his uniqueness. Um, maybe his timelessness. Because that, that, that name I am comes from the Hebrew word, the verb to be. So God is presented as like the creator, the one who is, the, the self-existent one, the timeless one maybe. And, and John is cueing into this when he calls God the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. Okay, now it gets weirder, though. Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Greetings from the seven spirits before his throne. Now, this could mean a few different things. we got a few good options. One venerable suggestion is these are the seven archangels of Jewish tradition that serve God. Uh, we're given the names of two of these in the Bible. You know them? Gabriel and Michael. Okay, in Jewish tradition, they had supplied the names of the other ones. And that, this is pretty current in the first century. So this could be what John has in mind. Uh, however, in the New Testament, rarely or never is the, actually the word spirit used for angels. Like they are spirits, but that's usually not the terminology. Um, it could be that these are... Um, the seven angels of the seven churches. Because John, Paul, Paul, John, whoever he is, John goes on to write these letters to these seven churches. And he addresses each one by saying, to the angel of the church in Grand Rapids. 
understanding a specific angel to be given oversight over each assembly. And so maybe John is talking about those seven angels. That could be. But um, I think the weirder, the weirder view is better in this case because it's Revelation, and oftentimes the weirder might be better. Um, there's a, one very common understanding of this and an old Christian understanding of this. This is a way of talking about the Holy Spirit. What John means when he says the seven spirits who are before his throne, he actually means the Holy Spirit. First of all, notice this reference comes between a reference to God, then we have the seven spirits thing, and then we have a reference to Jesus. And if we see this word spirit in close connection with God and Jesus, odds are this, we're going to tip our hat towards this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. So why would John call the Holy Spirit the seven spirits? Well, seven in the Bible denotes fullness, and there's a Jewish tradition of God's spirit being sort of sevenfold. So look at this example passage where this comes from, Isaiah 11, a prediction that actually points to Jesus, we would say. Look what it says. There's a sevenfold description of the Spirit here. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. Seven. And then we have this passage in Zechariah 4, another sort of apocalyptic sort of dreamlike vision and interpretation. The angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. It's a menorah. Picture the Jewish seven candlestick. Also, there were two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I replied. That's why I asked. No, I added that. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord is Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So it seems to be taking that lampstand as a symbol or an image of God's spirit. So I think we should understand this reference to the seven spirits before his throne as a picturesque sort of way of talking about the Holy Spirit. And maybe another reason it's seven is John would expect this is the spirit that is working in all of these seven churches. Now we go on to Jesus. So we have full, full-fledged Trinitarian reference here. Though there's not an emphasis on the oneness, perhaps. Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. That word witness, does anyone remember, by chance, what other English word we use to translate the Greek word for witness? Martyr. Yes. This is the Greek word martyr. Martyr means a witness. And this goes on in Christianity to take on the specific meaning of a witness who is faithful unto death and dies. But this word is used of Jesus here. So notice Jesus is called the faithful witness. Well, notice, is he also a martyr in the other sense? Does he die for his faithfulness to the message and for not backing down? Yeah, he does. And so notice this is said to this church that is right on the verge of suffering persecution as John is writing to persuade them to be willing to suffer death for their witness. And notice Jesus is said to be the firstborn from the dead, the beginning of the resurrection, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To these Christians, sort of beaten up and intimidated in Asia Minor, it looks like the Roman Empire has all the power. It looks like the local governors are the one holding the sword over their head and trying to get them to sacrifice to an image of the emperor and compromise their faith in Jesus. John says, don't misunderstand. This is one of the purposes of apocalyptic, to lift the veil and show us how things really are. Jesus is the king of kings and lord of lords. He's actually the one that's got all the power. Okay, so notice John is writing to Christians. They've experienced his grace. They've experienced salvation. So what is the proper response to this? Well, here's one of them. Look what John goes on to say. He sort of interrupts. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So John breaks out there into a moment of worship or praise. Do you see that? It kind of interrupts what he says and takes that moment to respond to Jesus, to God the Father, in worship and praise. And so here is one of our key purposes 
as Christians. One of those things we are to do and called to do is to serve God by honoring him, to worshiping him, to lifting him high in our affections, um, showing his worth to him, uh, returning to him honor for all he has done for us. We could talk forever about this little line here, verse 6. He's made us to be a what? A kingdom. We've been made into a kingdom. And priests to serve as God and Father. So notice when you become a believer in Jesus, not only are you saved and forgiven of your sins, you're brought into something. You're brought into something great and significant. You're brought into God's kingdom. You become a what? A priest. Did you realize you are a priest? So actually, this is a key reference to the Old Testament, Exodus 19.5, when God said to Israel, I will make you a kingdom of priests. This was said to the whole nation of Israel. They were supposed to be a righteous kingdom that demonstrated God's rule on earth. They were supposed to be a nation of priests that would mediate God's presence to the world. Well, how'd they do overall? Not so good. It's like we don't do so good. So notice the kingdom failed and fell apart because of unrighteousness. Notice instead of mediating God's presence properly, God wanted the nations to come to Israel to learn about Yahweh and to honor him, but boy, that didn't happen. And the nation goes into exile and essentially gets wiped out. Though they get brought back from exile and they're waiting for the restoration of God's promises in the first century. Well, here John takes this saying this promise to Israel in the Old Testament and applies it to us, the church. What God intended for Israel to do in the Old Testament, this is now our role as a kingdom and as priests to serve God. So notice how significant your role is. When we're talking about life purpose and meaning, you are part of God's kingdom. That means you are tasked with the responsibility of representing that kingdom. You are tasked with the responsibility of advocating that rule and for the values of that rule here on earth. So we are tasked to do things like advocate for truth, for righteousness, justice, mercy, compassion, help to the poor, all sorts of these things, the things that Jesus talked about when he was among us. And you are a priest. If you think through what does a priest do in the Old Testament, what's one of the big tasks of a priest related to this second core value. What did priests do in the temple? They praised and worshiped. They sacrificed. And notice, interestingly, the language of sacrifice. What is, notice how that's adapted in the New Testament a couple places, I don't remember where, but it says, bring forth or offer the sacrifice of praise. So as priests, instead of bringing the animal to the temple... This has apparently been shifted because Jesus was that final animal sacrifice, pictured, that we are to bring forth the sacrifice of praise. So notice, if you are a priest of God, and one of the tasks of the priest was to serve in the temple and to worship God and to honor God, this is part of our task. As we have received God's grace, we've been brought into his kingdom, we have been appointed as priests. This is why it is so significant when we come together to worship together and to honor him. So this is a huge part of who we are and what we are to do. So our first core value that we see in this passage, I think, is this, respond to Christ's message with obedience. Second core value for us is to respond to Christ's grace with worship or praise. This is a huge value for us. Let's look at the third one. Respond to Christ's coming with faith. Here's a major part of the book. Look at verse 7. You, you could probably take this as the theme verse or the key verse of the whole book of Revelation. Like here's maybe the main theme. Here's, sometimes it's valuable to think, okay, what's a key verse for a book of the Bible? Plausibly, this could be it for Revelation. Look at verse 7. John says, look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. Here's a weaving together of two scriptures in the Old Testament. And John takes these and uses them to show Jesus' return in the future and how it will be a fulfillment of these things. Look at the first one. This is Daniel 7, 
So this is one of these apocalyptic visions in the book of Daniel. Daniel has just been given a vision of these monsters, these beasts coming out of the sea, representing world powers, just like we'll see later in Revelation. And then Daniel is given a vision of the heavenly throne room. He sees God sitting on the throne, okay? And then he says he sees this, verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Son of man just means a human being. So notice he says, I I saw the monsters, I saw the beasts in my vision. But now I saw someone that, in contrast to the beast, this was a person, it was a human, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? God. So notice this isn't God, precisely, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now in Daniel 7, plausibly, the son of man, this is a symbol representing the nation of Israel. But There's some things said about it that are kind of mysterious. If that is symbolizing Israel, why is Israel coming in the clouds of heaven? Guess who or what comes with clouds in heaven in the Old Testament? Only one category of being. Gods, divinities, divine things. If this is just Israel, does all the nations worship it? That doesn't seem to quite fit. In the first century, some Jews have interpreted this vision to teach that there will be a pre-existent Messiah figure who God will send. The book of First Enoch, we read some from last week, has this expectation of this son of man. Jesus shows up on the scene. And what is Jesus' preferred title for himself? Son of man. Which isn't as weird as it sounds. It just means a human being. It's a little weird to talk about yourself that way. He calls himself a human being. So on one hand, it's just saying I'm a human. But on the other hand, in that terminology, Jesus is pointing back to this vision, this passage in Daniel 7. Somehow Jesus is claiming to be this figure. And so we are told at his trial before Pilate, Jesus says to Pilate, he says, like, what, are you the Christ? And Jesus in one of the Gospels says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. As Jesus takes this to point to himself and speak of his future return and vindication. So notice what a weird mix we have in Daniel 7. Someone who's a human, seemingly, uh, but worshipped as a god. Coming with clouds like God, but he's not God. Somehow also mysteriously representing the nation of Israel. And then you think, what does the Gospel of Matthew do with Jesus? Presenting Jesus as the true Israel, representing the people Israel. So Jesus is faithful Israel, God's son. And so it's interesting how it all ties together. Well, look at the second passage, Zechariah 12. I will pour out on the, this is in the context of restoration to Israel. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they've pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. John takes this and applies it to Jesus in his second coming. Notice where Zechariah there was focused just on Jerusalem, just on Israel, John takes it and universalizes it. Look, he says, every eye will see him. All peoples on earth will mourn. Why are people going to mourn when Jesus comes? I thought Jesus coming is good. John says, all the people on the earth will mourn. Why will they be mourning? Yeah. Because while Jesus coming is good news for those who have accepted his grace, and have pledged themselves to him, Jesus' coming will be profoundly bad news for those who have not. So John says, all peoples on the earth will mourn because of Jesus. So shall it be. Amen. So how certain is this going to happen? Notice how John seems to underline the certainty of this and the confidence we should have this by what he says next, what he reports God is saying. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega, first and last letter of the Greek alphabet. I'm the beginning and the end. Figure of speech called a merism. Use opposites to show the whole thing. Top to bottom, 
left to right, everything in between. God is the beginning. He's the end. He holds authority over all. Who is, who was, who is to come. We get that repeated again. God in his essential otherness, his timelessness, his majesty, his power. Finally, the Almighty. That's the term that the Old Testament Greek used to translate the Lord of hosts, the Yahweh of angelic armies, the all-powerful. The point seems to be, you can take this to the bank. Okay, if this is true, if this is the true God, if God has acted this way in Jesus, if the resurrection has begun this, then we find ourselves in the time of the last days, the earth sitting on the cusp of falling into God's judgment and salvation, and it's been like that for 2,000 years. And Jesus will return. This is a core hope of the gospel that he will finally come to defeat evil and restore all things. And God seems to underline it here by his statements, I am the Alpha and Omega who was, is, is to come, the Almighty and the All-Powerful. So the expectation clearly is that we are to believe this, we are to trust this, and live and position our lives accordingly. So three core values here. One, respond to Christ's message with obedience. Two, respond to Christ's grace with praise or worship. Three, respond to Christ's coming with faith. So what's the bottom line for us? Look at the back of your outline. Let's put it this way. Consider your engagement with these three values. I just want you to think about this. Notice I've given you three thermometers. I want you to think through, okay, each of these core values, which I think it's fair to say are things that should mark the lives of all Christians. To what degree do these three mark me right now for my day-to-day life? Just color yourself in. Like, if you're kind of not so much, colored in a little bit. If you're like, yeah, I'm pretty much focused on this all the time, color it all the way up. Think about that. Then ask yourself this. If God were calling, to in- calling you to increase your engagement with these, with one of these, which one would it be? Which one of these in this season of your life is most needed or most strategic or most helpful for your heart to remain set on loving the Lord and following him? And then I want you to ask, okay, what's one step you would like to take this week to actually position yourself to grow in the area that you would desire to grow in? Okay, well, today we looked at this key passage that I always say that every week, this key passage. They're all key passages. That's why I say that every week. This key passage in the beginning of the book of Revelation where we see three uh, core values for all of us as Christians, I think. Uh, First, respond to Christ's message with obedience. Second, respond to Christ's grace with praise or worship. And third, respond to Christ's coming with faith. And I hope you'll carve out some time to get alone and really consider those three values and and where you are this week and what the Lord would have you do uh, to grow in whatever area you would aim to grow in. We don't want this to be our story, okay? We don't want this to be our purpose, all right? Our life just as a warning to others, okay? And we also don't want this to be our purpose, just just our own manufactured, our created purpose. As valuable as that is to get through life, We want to connect with the actual purpose, the actual God has for us. And this will involve stepping into our role as members of his kingdom, serving him, honoring him, and worshiping him. If you're here today and and you've perhaps never made that formal decision to like, yes, I want to sign on the dotted line. I want to pledge my allegiance to Jesus. I want to be part of this kingdom. I want my sins forgiven. Uh, I'll hang out down here after the service. I'd love for you to come and talk to me. Or if you want prayer for any reason, feel free to come on up and we can spend some time together up here. So, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Repay no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Serve and love the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.